Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight's guest is Alex Liu, Associate Professor of Environmental Exposure Biology in the Department of Environmental Health, Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Liu received his doctorate from the School of Public Health and Community Medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle in 1996, and he was an assistant professor in the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in Georgia before joining Harvard in 2008. Dr. Liu's research is concerned with one of the greatest challenges in science today, how toxic chemicals in our environment are affecting many species and whole ecological systems. He'll explain tonight how his exposure biology lab has established the link between the massive loss of honeybees over recent decades and the use of a particular class of insecticides. Since honeybees are essential for agriculture, there's an urgent need to determine the cause of this loss known as colony collapse disorder. Dr. Liu is an assistant editor for Environmental Health Perspectives, one of the leading peer-reviewed journals of environmental health, and he serves on the scientific advisory panel to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. In addition to his outstanding research, Dr. Liu has led service to public health beyond the lab, which includes efforts to reduce the use of pesticides in urban housing. He's also engaged in making technical information about toxins like insecticides understandable to non-specialized. We very much appreciate Dr. Liu's leadership in both research and educating the public, and it is a great pleasure to welcome him tonight. Welcome, Dr. Liu. Thank you, Yvonne, for having me in the program. I'd like to get some background to start with, and that is uh, about honeybees in general. Why are honeybees important? Well, first of all, honeybee is a very effective and efficient pollinator. In general, they pollinate one-third of the, the food that we eat every day. Uh, if you look at California, for example, mm. two-thirds of agricultural products that uh, California planted require pollination, which is done by honeybees. So it's very important, not for the, uh, the ecological perspective, but also for human consumption, human nutrition perspective as well. Okay, so we need them, and by the way, I understand that they are now hand pollinating in California because of the loss of so many honeybees. Uh, so humans are out there <laughs> trying to do some pollinating, which is not very efficient. Anyway, then the next thing is, what is this colony collapse disorder? Uh, if you could So colony collapse disorder, or we call CCD, is a relatively new disease. It occurred in this country in 2005, 2006, by a surprise to many commercial beekeepers because they never witnessed such problem during their uh, profession uh -huh. as a commercial beekeepers. So what happened is that um, when the hive was considered healthy and was ready to be overwintered in, you know, anywhere you, you possibly think, and all of a sudden, within a week or two, the, 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 the bees in that specific colony disappear. And the beekeeper has a hard time to uh, account for all the dead bees in, in the hive. So one of the beekeeper who happened to be interviewed by CBS 60 Minutes, um, yeah. he called USDA and asked them to send researchers or experts to, uh, to Florida to check on He's high because he said that this is a crisis. I lost more than 90% mm. of the 40,000 hive that he's supposed to make a living of it. So 
this is, uh, I will make a distinction that these, these, these uh, commercial hive of beekeepers migrate from one huge farm to another. Very much, uh, is that true? Yeah, across so the country. So the, 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 they couldn't be, the sudden decimation of the bees couldn't be due to the stress of just moving these around because they've been doing that for ages. Right. Okay, so that's that. So, and it was rather abrupt. Right. Okay. And then there has been a lot of controversy about CCD. And could you, by any means, give us a little background about the different perspectives from the environmentalists, the health officials, and so okay. on? Okay. So the, the, in terms of the CCD itself, it's a symptomatic disease because so far, we couldn't find any uh, possible linkage to the cause of CCD. I'm talking about the pathogen-wise. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, many factors that could uh, put pressures on the survival of honeybee hives. For example, there are known pathogens mm -hmm. that could take down the beehive really quickly. Or if you are the new beekeepers or less competent beekeepers, um, you could put harms on the beehives. Uh, if, you, if we have a prolonged winter mm -hmm. in which the hive did not store enough honey, that single factor alone could trigger the death of the hive. But for all those causes that can kill a, one single hive, they all lead to the same consequence or observation, mm -hmm. which is the beekeeper can look at the, the bottom of the hive and there are thousands of dead bees over there. But for CCD, it's totally different. Uh -huh. that the hive become empty. All those adult bees left their hive in the, in the middle of the winter, which they are not supposed to. They don't even know how to do that, right? right? Most of the when time, the, right. When the outside temperature yeah. below 54 degrees Fahrenheit, bee wouldn't go out because first of all, there's no flowers, there's no pollen right, right. for them to full range. And also it's too cold. They will just drop on the, on the ground and, and be killed. So there's a the basic instinct. The bee will stay in the hive during the winter, but for them to go out and almost a suicidal act, it's unthinkable. Right. But that's the definition of colony collapse disorder. Or oh, okay. So that it's again that the hive empties. Yeah. And they you you're not finding a bunch of dead bees no, in the don't. hive at all. Right. And I think you're going to you know make that clear again right. later. Okay. That brings us to research about this. Can you tell us to start with? What do epidemiologists do? That, and that's your territory. So. Yeah. so we try to identify the plausible cause or causes to colony collapse disorder at a time when it was first emerged in this country, which is 2005, mm -hmm. 2006. The timing coincides with the new practice in, in terms of making genetically modified corn seed, which because in the past we use this cocoa Bt corn. Mm -hmm. And Bt is a bacteria that's in the environment. They secrete a toxin which is very effective in terms of killing insect that will otherwise harm the corn plant, especially mm -hmm. the seedling plant, mm -hmm. especially for those worms that are living in the soil. So we have been planting genetically modified corn seed that, that has a, a Bt in it for many, many years. Mm -hmm. But we do know that once we use a pesticide, doesn't matter if it's synthetic or natural, it will develop resistance. Mm -hmm. So 2004, 2005 was the year that the industry need to find a new solution for pest control. And they found this new, not necessarily new, but relatively new insecticide called neonicotinoid. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason they were able to use neonicotinoid in their genetically engineering corn seed because those insecticides are considered systemic, meaning that once you put it on the seed, and the, the seed itself, when they grow, they will, the pesticide will grow with the plant. Mm -hmm. So the pesticide residue will be in every single tissue of the plant. So from the pest control perspective, this is wonderful. But if you think about the plant, that the pesticide will not just stay in the plant. Right. They will come out in pollens. They will come out in nectars. In fact, they will come out 
uh, in the quotation drop that we seen in the morning. And those, those pesticides in those different medias are becoming detrimental to pollinators like yeah, bees right. who forage on it. So in 2004, they start using neonicotinoids in those genetic engineering corn seeds. And then the, we know that we, we grow those corn, it's not for direct human consumption. We make different byproducts. One of the common byproducts that we uh, use all the time is called high fructose corn syrup. And that high fructose corn syrup happened to be the wonderful sugar alternative for those commercial beekeepers because they take the honey away from the hive for, for sales and they had to put something back for the hive for the, for the bee to, to, to consume. High fructose corn syrup has been the alternative for many, many years. And, but because the switch, the change of the, the pesticide in mm -hmm. 2005 that lead to chronic collapse disorder in this country. So we use this hypothesis um, to guide Harvard's study in 2012, which we were able to demonstrate that um, a little bit of neonicotinoid in high fructose corn syrup that we use to feed to our hive will lead to common clap disorder in the winter. Mm. So if you look at the, uh, the upper left hand side of the, the, the photo, it's a classic hive that suffer from colony collapse disorder. You can see that there's no bee um, left in the hive. However, the hive has enough store honey for the winters, but that's it. But if you look at the, the photo at the bottom of the, 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 the pictures, it is the hive that successfully overwinter uh, because that year Massachusetts has a very long winter. So the hive all come up to the top of the, uh, the frame and asking for sugar because they pretty much exhaust the, the store honey. Uh, in that case, we have to feed them with uh, table sugar. Um, so hopefully the spring will come soon, they can go out and work. The other picture shows that's the only control hive that in our study that die or in, during the winter. But the, but the post-mortem observation of that control hive which we didn't apply uh, neonicotinoid to them at all, has a very different symptoms than the CCD hive. You see lots of dead bees at the bottom of the hive. You see a lot of fecal matters in the hive. That tells you that this hive has suffered from nosema infection. That is, is a very common parasite in the gut uh, of the bee that eventually trigger the death of the hive. Excuse me, this is the, this is the picture on the bottom. This is the picture, the picture on, on the bottom. bottom. Okay. So those three pictures give you a very clear indication in terms of what is the hive, what is a healthy hive look like at the end of the, of the spring or the beginning of the, of the mm -hmm. spring. Mm -hmm. uh, also, what does the hive look like if it suffers from CCD? And then what does the hive look like if the hive died of common disease, like in this case, would be the, the parasite in the gut. Then could you tell us how you set up that gorgeous so study? So we, we simulate the, the practice that co commercial beekeeper commonly use, which is feed the hive with high fructose corn syrup. In our study, we were able to acquire almost no pesticide uh, high fructose corn syrup, and then we fortify those sugar syrup with the no amount of the neonicotinoid I see. That, we, that we know. And that is uh, immunocrobit. Immunoclobid has been the most commonly used insecticide worldwide, not just in the United States. It has been uh, implicated as a cause of a colony collapse disorder. So we use immunoclobid as a target neonicotinoid in our Harvard study, okay. the first Harvard study. We fed uh, the high with uh, neonicotinoid high fructose corn syrup for 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. And we monitored the, the health of the hive throughout the summers. And we found no difference whatsoever mm -hmm. between neonicotinoid treated versus control hive. Mm -hmm. And we, after the, the, the passage of the summer, we get the hive ready for overwinter. And even by then, we still see no differences in terms of the strength of the hive and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. But magically, a week before Christmas, we start seeing the death of the hive, uh -huh. one after another one. And the symptoms resemble to CCDs. 
Uh -huh. Meaning that the hive just disappeared. Right. There's no adobes at the bottom of the of the, of the hive. We couldn't even account for the number outside the hive, and so by uh, by the beginning of March, we lost 15 out of the 16 neonicotinoid treated hive, which we show you the picture over there. Uh, for the control hive, we lost one. Uh -huh. uh, let me ask you, it seems to me that I read that the, um, a lot of the studies that had been made did not have this prolonged time. So they'd cut it off at week whatever it was. So it seemed as though the neonicotinoid, the, the insecticide was not causing the problem but you let it go longer. Was that like one of the only studies that did that? Well, when we first published the study, it was the only study uh, that involved the whole colony. Ah. Also look at the, the health of the colony over multiple generations, uh, uh, right. including the generation that required overwinter. We done so because we understood CCD often happened in the winter. I see. Not in the summer I see. or in the fall. Right. So it is very intuitive for us to follow this research or experiment throughout the whole, almost whole year. And the other thing that I want to emphasize here is that we know so little about the toxicity of pesticides mm. or any chemicals. So we don't know whether the level that below the lethal dosage would cause any harm Mm -hmm. to organisms like mm -hmm. honeybees or human. So in our study, we always use the level we call sub -lethal, which means that the level of the pesticide we use would not kill the bee right away. Mm -hmm. So the bee were actually healthy and survival and then actually quite robust. But somehow, multiple generations later, the bee in the colony die out one after another. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, that's fascinating because it kind of highlights that if we try to define what is the toxicity of pesticides or other chemicals, we have to look at not only the lethal dosage, but also the sub-lethal dosage. We, only, we cannot look at just at a cross-sectional manner. We have to look at longitudinal, yeah. maybe over multiple generations. Right. That's that's very interesting. So the, the two really important things were that you used a sublethal level. Exactly. Uh, as a, is that different from what they were doing to the plants, what, what you would find in the plants that the insects would be pollinating? Well, it, it depends upon how much pesticide has fructose. been used, yeah. yes. But sublethal level has always been assumed as safe level uh -huh, right. for organisms. Right, right, right. But in this study, we, we show that sublethal might be safe at this given time, right. but not necessarily true uh, in later generations. The second thing there is that you're following one generation of bees, correct? I don't know if they live a year or two years or, or something, but uh, so it's that the generation that feeds in the spring, they hibernate in the winter, uh, and they are dying off in the winter. So that's one generation? No. Actually, they... bee is quite fascinating in the way that even though those worker bees, they were the sisters, they're the daughter to the same yeah. mother, um, they have a very different longevity. Ah. So for generation that in spring, summer, or early fall, especially in the, in the area like Massachusetts, we have a very distinct winter. Mm -hmm. Those earlier worker bees live somewhere around 30 to 35 days. Oh. And then they die out naturally. I By see. By the time that the winter bee population emerge, which usually uh, happen in October, those worker bees live somewhere around 200 days. I see. So when you define generation, you have to be clear about is it in the summer generation or the winter I generation. See. We use this different longevity from the same queen as a basis to look into the fact that whether uh, pesticide could have lingering effect in later generation, which we actually found out that's the case. However, we never determined to incorporate this type of a transgenerational toxicity into any kind of regulatory uh, uh, practice, which to me is very inadequate. Yes. 
there's one more thing before we leave that. I don't know if the studies that have typically been done before have been in situ like yours, being out in the field, in the hives, and under natural conditions. Uh, is that the case? Have the other studies been, is that typical? They do them like that or they do them in the lab? Um, before we publish the results, most of the study involving single bees in the incubators ah, in the laboratories. In the lab. right. And because of the Harvard study that we published in 2012 and 2014, there are some study that are uh, reporting results from the whole colony yeah. uh, basis in the natural environment. But again, I would say that the number of studies is still not adequate. Right. Why did they do these things in the lab, which seems uh, like it would compromise results. So not why not only that, that? Um, honeybee is not like the rat or the mice. Ah. They are social insect. They Good live point. as one colony. So we have to look, especially CCD is not affecting one single bee. CCD is affecting the whole colony. So it makes sense that you design a study uh, based on the colony, not individuals. And we decided to do that with the, consult, uh, the consultation from my two colleagues who are very, very experienced beekeepers. Yes, so you, you went ahead, you did this study, you got these spectacular results. It's a very unique study. It's just perfectly clear. And what was the reaction? Um, the reaction was very extreme. Um, some people believe that we are on the right trajectory to identify the most likely uh, culprit to this horrible disease called colony collapse disorder. Whereas many people believe that Harvard study was fundamentally flawed mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to some degree that it probably make up and there's no basis and so on and so forth. Even though you had all of this evidence. Uh, not only the evidence, uh, for people that are criticizing Harvard study, they never want to talk about the establishment of the control hive right next I to see. the neonicotinoid treated right. hive. So they omit that part, and, and to me that's Right, shouldn't be published. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. They'd have to take the, the whole thing. In terms of, say, environmentalists, farmers, you have different groups. How did these different groups react? You have industry, which I uh, can predict right. what they had to say, but the in uh, and research people. Could you say something about the reactions in these groups? Well, even among the the scientists, big keepers, um, and so on, the reaction also split. It's interesting, right? Some beekeeper react very negatively to Harvard studies. Because of the fructose. Right, and, but some beekeepers found out that this is probably uh, the result that has come too late yeah. to save their bees. Yeah. And also to many academic uh, researchers, uh, their reaction is also very split. However, I would say that even though people have doubt on our studies, they don't want to replicate our study. And that to me is quite surprising. Yes. Because right. for the, uh, in, in, in the profession as a, a scientific researcher, if you found somebody's research is not holding up uh, or you know, is, is erroneous, you will de design your own study and try to come up with a different set of results. Right. But so far, there's no other study right. that actually aim to replicate Harvard study. How about environmental people? Were they more uh, sympathetic to the results? Well, for people that are engaging in protecting environment and ecology, they already suspect mm -hmm. neonicotinoid mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is the most likely culprit to this horrible uh, disease called colony collapse disorder. So once we publish the result, they're using this as, as sort of like uh, the, the, the reason to move to the next step, which mm -hmm. is to ban or limited use of neonicotinoid. So from, for, for the environmentalists, I think the response is mostly positive. Um, they want more from the government to, 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 to face this and then to deal with this issue. Um, I have to say this though, uh, for the last three, four years, um, 
neonicotinoids is not we it's not just the honeybee that suffer <laughs> from neonicotinoid toxicities. <laughs> There's a lot of birds that get yeah. killed by neonicotinoids. Right. There's a lot of aquatic uh, invertebrate or vertebrates that also got affected by the uh, immunocrobit. It's not only because of the toxicity of those insecticides, but also their persistence. Yes. Uh, we know that they have a relatively short biological half-life, but for some reason, once those neonicotinoids uh, were applied in the environments, their biological half-life become very, very long. Ah, um, so the whole food chain I I right. in effect. So if you consider the, 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 the lengthy biological half-life and on top of the repetitive application yes, on a right. yearly was, basis, yes, right. we essentially are dealing with another uh, group of pesticides that is, is resemble uh, DDT. Exactly, I was going to say, it sounds like deja vu right. here, that we, we went through this, we went through this horrible denial period, everything right. was dying, the birds' right. eggs and everything were right. affected. Why are we not putting an end to the use of neonicotinoids? Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is that neonicotinoid is probably the only insecticide that is still considered safe to use. Safe. We pretty much exhaust um, the reserve list of the insecticides because every insecticide that we've been using, for example, organophosphate, mm -hmm. um, run into the issue of resistance mm -hmm. in, in, in the environment. Also, uh, post human health effect has been uh, proven by many epidemiology researchers. So neonicotinoid in this regard, relatively new, unproven, and that's why government believe that this is a safe insecticide. Government worry that by taking away neonicotinoid from farmers, from individuals, from households, from public health application, mm -hmm. we left no tool to combat the, the pest issues and so on. So they're protecting neonicotinoid because there are no plausible safer alternative. Although this is in fact not safe and we don't know what the end result on say human health or larger right. mammals. But if you look at the, the literature, yeah. um, there's not many literature that documenting the, the adverse health outcome, especially mm -hmm. in mammals, mm -hmm. as a result of a neonicotinoid. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge void there mm -hmm. that we, we need to do more research. Unfortunately, um, there's not many funding out there that will allow us uh, to conduct either mammal or human uh, research. So you are not able to obtain the facts, you're not able to establish the facts because you can't get the money to do right. the research. Do you expect any help down the line in terms of, of support for the prolonged work? Um, we have a very different uh, regulatory mechanism uh, comparing to European Union, yes. for example. So almost two years ago, the European Union decided to take action mm -hmm. because of their, uh, their uh, um, how should I say this, their uh, constitution mandate that if a crisis is affecting either environment or human health, the government only need a little bit of scientific information, um, but they have to exercise the precautionary principle to do something. Mm -hmm. to either mitigate it mm -hmm. or prevent mm -hmm. the further mm -hmm. damage. Mm -hmm. We don't have that kind mm -hmm. of precautionary principle in our constitution, so Congress has no mandate to do anything, although I do believe that we have enough scientific results uh, to are, merit yeah. um, action. So in this case, I would say the most effective and timely action that we can do is from municipal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Local level. Like on the local level. If the local decided that we have so much uh, risk, uh, losing bees and so on and so forth, then they can decide what they're going to do. And if we can have more municipalities uh, to be on board to look into this matter and decide whether they should either ban or limiting the use of neonicotinoid, I think by then, whether Congress want to add it or not doesn't matter because mm -hmm. we have a lot of towns and cities decided mm -hmm. to face mm -hmm. them out. Mm -hmm. The best example would be Ontario, Canada. Yes. Right. Uh, right. So the federal government yeah. in Canada decided to follow exactly what United States has yeah. been doing. 
However, Ontario decided that we couldn't wait right. for Ottawa right. to, to do anything. So they have a proposal. The proposal actually uh, put more restriction on the usage than the European Union. Uh, but I think that's probably the way to go. And I'm very, very looking forward not only uh, to see the passage of this regulation, but also to look at how effective this new uh, regulation will be in two, three years. Right. And see whether really we couldn't live without near the Katinoi. Yes. Well, on that, what is your feeling about that? Do you think that it's worth it? The argument we get from the farming industry in particular is, is, uh, is that we, we can't possibly do without these massive uh, insecticides. And well, pesticide is the identical issue to the abusement of antibiotic use. Absolutely, yes, okay. We couldn't live without yes, antibiotics. Right. But the reason we have an antibiotic crisis is because it's we because abuse exactly. the usage of antibiotics. Yeah. Pesticide is exactly the same thing. I see. Farmers were told to use pesticide even though there's no pest okay. issues, even though there's no weed problem. They still use it. Yeah. So we do know that when you are dumping chemicals on the organism, doesn't matter if it's human or we or insect, they will develop resistance. It's just a matter of time. Right. So what happened right now is that we are exhausting the pipeline of the pesticide that we are we can use. So right now, if we also take away neonicotino, then we really have no other pesticides. Yeah. The government had to go back to look into whether we should use DDT or use not. organophosphate. Yes. So this is, to me, is a crisis. Need to have a broader discussions. We cannot let agrochemical to decide that what farmers should spray, when they should spray. I think farmers need to come to the common sense uh, education. So hopefully, we still can use pesticide in the more mutual benefit way. Mm -hmm. So we can preserve those pesticides when we really need it. Uh, especially when we are dealing with public health crisis. We're talking about West Nile uh, viruses. We're talking about the triple E issue and so on. There's so many bird flu going on right now mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. on the global basis. If we really have no pesticide mm -hmm. that we can use to kill those pathogens, then I think we are in serious trouble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so you need to have something. This doesn't appear to be the solution in no. any case. In terms of other countries, is for example, you mentioned you had to actually publish this outside the United States because it's so hard for researchers doing this kind of stuff to publish in the United States right now. Um, it, it, in t what the attitude of other countries, what is the situation in terms of dealing with these neonicotinoids now? So as far as I know, European Union is working on their new risk assessment, mm -hmm. dealing with chemical like neonicotinoid mm -hmm. that we know so little mm -hmm. about their toxicity, mm -hmm. both at the lethal level and at the sub lethal level. So they are drafting a new risk assessment protocol, hopefully will be adequate enough to deal with chemicals that can pose similar problems mm -hmm, like chronic mm -hmm, clap mm -hmm. disorder. And I really welcome that um, effort because that we have been ignoring mm -hmm. the sublethal toxicity, not just for pesticides, but for many chemicals that we expose on a daily basis. We really, look, really need to look at this sublethal effect not only in this generation, but multiple generations. Uh, because the sublethal, is it because it's retained in systems passed on and in food everywhere? Return in, in the sense that they modify our GMO. Uh -huh. So we pass those impaired GMO to the next generation, okay. to the next generation. It's a matter of the time, of the condition. If both are right, then they could trigger the mutation of that specific GMO that could render disease that exactly. otherwise you have no clue why we have so many uh, cancer patients. Exactly. Why and people get in cancer yeah. at much earlier age. Yeah. Do you see countries resisting this down the line that they won't have this? Um, I'm sure that there are going to be more nation, no more countries that would look into this uh, neonicotinoid and the sublethal effect, not only in bees, but many other organisms, yeah. including human down the road. There are some 
uh, studies uh, showing that neonicotinoid at the sublethal level could affect neurological right. effect, uh, especially in fetus. Yes. Uh, not in human that. fetus, but in, in, in animal fetus. Yeah. And that is a concern. Right. Um, um, I hope that we were able to conduct more research, both the in vivo, in vitro, and human study, to, to, to make sure that we understand uh, uh, the whole issue of lethal and sublethal level neonicotinoid. I was thinking you said not necessarily humans, but we have workers uh, all in, in many fields here, especially in this the big, big agriculture. And there are pictures in the press of these people being sprayed, basically because they spray from above or wherever, and they're told that everything's okay, and you think immediately that some of these women must be pregnant, but it might affect everybody. Do you think so? Is there a possibility that it affects human fetus? Well, this is exactly what I want to highlight in terms yeah. of the pesticide toxicity, is that, yes, it might be okay at this moment yeah, in right. time, but you don't know what happened to this person in 10 years right. or 20 years, right. or this person happened to be a female and she got pregnant. Yeah. What happened to the fetus? Because yes. we never track of those incidents right. 10 or 20 years after. Right. So yes, it might be safe at this moment, but not necessarily safe. And in, in other words, it doesn't have to be just spreading directly on the individual. A little bit of dosage of the right. pesticide yeah. that has no yeah observable vac whatsoever right now in this current right. generation could lead to something very dramatic. Right. And the reason I say that because this is exactly what happened to honey bee hive that suffer from colony collapse disorder. Because those hives were considered healthy and vibrant in the summer, in the fall, but somehow those right. bees disappear from this hive. It catches up later, it catches up later. Right. And those are the gen different generation of bees. You've done other kinds of work as well. You've been very active in the public domain, I think, in terms of trying to get uh, to control the use of pesticides in urban dwellings. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, my interest of promoting non-pesticide-based practice is exactly what I just mentioned, is that we need to reserve those pesticides mm -hmm. for the most critical moment mm -hmm. that we have to use them. And most of them are related to public health issues. But in terms of residential pest control, for example, there are many, many ways that we can, we can do to get rid of the cockroaches, mosquitoes, without using chemicals. Uh -huh. And those need to be promoted, uh, need to be encouraged. I have to say that more and more households are getting the message right now because they understood that we use using pesticide where our kids play, mm -hmm. in the living room, in, 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 in the dining room. Uh, we put down lots of pesticide in the front yards and the backyard. Your toddler crawl on it, yeah, or your uh, pets yeah, uh, play yeah. on it. So more and more people demand no pesticide treatment, uh, integrated pest management. They don't even want to see the word pesticides. And I think this is a very positive. Yes. But unfortunately, I have to say, though, because of many reasons like climate change and so on and so forth, we have other challenges that right. maybe pesticide is the only solution. For example, the bed bug issues. Yeah. It's getting to the point that I not understand. only- bed bugs are thriving not on only the pesticides. Not only <laughs> white spray, because <laughs> we use so much pesticide on uh -huh. those bed bugs, they develop, they quickly develop- Start to uh, like the, it. The huh? resistance. <laughs> yeah. This is the same issue in Africa when, we, when they try to deal with malaria. They used lots of pyrethroid. And five, 10 years later, none of pyrethroid worked because uh -huh. those mosquitoes develop resistance right yes. away. That's why WHO allows some usage of DDTs. So the question is, do we want to go back to the DDT era? Yeah, right. Or is there some other better solution? Right. So in my opinion, the solution is try to do non-pesticide practice yes. first. Yes. If it works, it works. If not, then you think about something else. Right. Don't jump into the pesticide war right away. Right. Because we do know that if you rely on pesticide or you're addicted to pesticides, eventually the pesticide will become useless because of resistance.
I see. So they're a lot like bacteria then. After a while, the cockroaches and mosquitoes and everything start to like it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. and usually it's a stronger one that <laughs> laugh, that develop the resistance. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, just just an, an adaptation, but right. they're very good at it. And uh, so you've been actively working with the public to get better solutions to these kinds of problems. But in the process, presumably, you're able to educate the public as well. Mm -hmm. And another one of your gifts is that you work to try to kind of translate these complex chemicals and, and all of that, this kind of research for the public as well. Do you anticipate doing more of that sort of thing? I ask because some people will write books and things right. like that. I think that we have a lot of new tools mm -hmm. that allow researchers to get onto these difficult issues in terms of, for example, is organic really yeah. healthier than conventional food? Mm -hmm. And totally yes, mm -hmm. but scientifically speaking, we don't have that data. Mm -hmm. But now we do have some tool that allow us to look into this uh, issue in terms of long-term consumption mm -hmm. of organic food mm -hmm. does uh, provide some protection to individuals' health than conventional food that come with some um, pesticides. Mm -hmm. um, organic agriculture, organic food is another area that I would like to promote it because anecdotally it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It protects the environment, it protects your watershed, right, right. it protects the soil, and it produces food that has no uh, synthetic chemical in it. But how to prove that's the case would require some um, a very, very dedicated scientific uh, research. Uh, it's not that we will have it tomorrow, but hopefully we will have it in the near future. Right. I'm impressed, by the way, with the rather quick turnaround in a country that has been heavy on processed food and agribiz for years, since post-war period, and suddenly uh, we've been through the organic phase for a while, but it was a minority. But now there's a tremendous interest in it, in small community uh, area farms and so on. So there may be hope in that uh, regard. It's not that difficult for people to finalize, to finally realize that pesticide might be the reason mm -hmm. uh, for the increase in disease burden in the society, because especially in this country, mm. We clean up the airs, we clean up our waters, we make our life better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How come more and more people are getting sick? Yes, right. What's wrong and with- And as you say, younger. What's wrong with this picture? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look back, there's only one thing that we haven't dealt with yet, that is the food. And everybody has to eat. Right. Right. And if you look at what people were eating 10 years ago compared to today, uh, it's a dramatic difference mm -hmm. because more people decided that I don't want this. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the local farmer's market. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. buy my CSA. I want to buy it directly from the farmer who I know that they didn't use pesticides. So there is a change. The change is not because spontaneous. It's because a lot of observation. People decided I'm going to take this on my own hand. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait for government to tell me which one is better. But I do know anecdotally the apple has no pesticide has to be better than yes, apple that right. was a little bit of pesticides. Yeah. Organic so this is something so that yeah. we in, in the academic setting mm -hmm. would promote it mm -hmm. because it's a win-win-win situation. Yeah, right. it's a, it, it, farmer is a winner if they're willing to mm -hmm. produce healthier and organic produce, right? Environment is a winner because mm -hmm. there's no less synthetic chemical into the environment. Consumer is a winner. Mm -hmm. Although they have to put out a little bit more money to buy organic apples, but at the end, they get healthier That's and so right. on. So if you look at the picture, and this is exactly what we should promote it, mm -hmm. and we cannot wait until government to tell us what to do. Right. Well, we really appreciate your efforts on this end. I, I definitely uh, thank you for that. I, before we close, I would like to just get a little bit of background of, of your own personal background. How did you get into this field? Um, because when I was in the doctoral program, um, our research is on the east side of the Cascade Mountain in the Washington state. I personally witnessed lots of pesticide usage. Oh. Um, and, and to me, that's 
not necessary. But when I talked to the farmers about the usage of pesticide, the answer was, what else we can do? Right. Never occurred to anybody. Right. So there's a misconnection there. Yes. But I have to say that that was the 1990s, uh -huh. right? But now it's 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. More and more farmers decided that you know, maybe organic practice is the way to go, not those conventional chemical-based agricultural practice. So I do see the change, and yes. I hope the change will continue. Yes, I hope so. And I, we appreciate your great work um, and wish you all the best success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And I'll let you just talk.